Building a healthy gut microbiome. What shaped your microbial garden? The purpose of today's video is to give you a better grasp on the gut microbiome and how it works. And we're going to do that by discussing what the gut microbiome is. Then we'll move along to how the gut microbiome works, how our gut shapes our gut microbiome, how our gut microbiome shapes our gut, and how our gut microbiome uh, interacts with the rest of our body and how the rest of our body also interacts with the gut microbiome. We'll then move on to strategies on how do we build a healthy gut microbiome? What environmental factors within our lives are important for shaping our gut microbiome to shift it more towards healthiness and away from disease? And then finally, we'll discuss the recent development of uh, different programs centered around microbiome analysis and using microbiome analysis to help dictate uh, the best diet for a person. Is this something that we can do? Is this something that's ready for prime time now? We'll discuss all that towards the end of the video. Let's begin by discussing what a microbiome is. A microbiome is a collection of microorganisms covering our external surfaces. When we refer to microorganisms, we're going to center around bacteria, fungi, and archaea. Viruses would also be included in that group of um, microorganisms as well. However, uh, we typically refer to the virome when we're discussing viruses, so we won't really include them in our discussion of the microbiome because generally they're separated. And we're going to focus on the gut microbiome. So as I mentioned, all external surfaces and even some internal surfaces have a microbiome. For example, um, there's a skin microbiome, a scalp microbiome, a uh, vaginal microbiome, and of course, the gut microbiome. And these are all external surfaces. Most people don't think of the gut as an external surface, but it is. It's essentially a hollow tube that runs, runs from our mouth to our anus, and it is exposed to the external world. It's not within us. And we're going to focus on this gut microbiome. This gut microbiome, like all microbiomes, while you have a skin microbiome, your skin microbiome isn't the same across your skin. Uh, there's a different microbiome in, in your groin area. There's a different microbiome in, in your armpits versus on your, um, you know, say you, the front part of your elbow um, or uh, on your bicep. The, they're very different. And that's because microbes vary according to the niche. This is going to be dependent on different environmental factors. So when we're looking at the gut microbiome, the mouth will have a different microbiome than the stomach. The stomach will have a different microbiome than the small intestine. And the small intestine will have a different microbiome uh, than the colon. And within the digestive tract, our gut microbiome helps perform various functions that have to do with that, uh, that digestive tract. It affects our digestion, our gut motility, vitamin synthesis, uh, xenobiotic metabolism. Xenobiotics are things found in food that can have biological functions within us, things such as polyphenols um, and things of that nature. And it also modulates our immune function. It can help promote a stable, healthy environment in the gut by promoting immune balance and making sure inflammation and things uh, that can become deleterious don't get out of control. There have been several myths on the number of bacterial cells uh, in comparison to our cells. Many people have come up with a number of 10 to 1. Uh, as it turns out, uh, the most recent number, it's actually pretty close. Uh, we have 39 trillion bacterial cells covering our body, and we have 30 trillion human cells. So they are pretty close. Now, most, 95% of these microbes are found in our colon. Uh, interestingly enough, one poop can completely change uh, the proportion of bacteria are to human. You can, you know, start the day uh, with 39 trillion bacteria and only 30 trillion human cells, but then at the end, uh, after your first defecation, uh, you may see a, a substantial drop in those bacterial numbers. But what's interesting about this is, while we have all of these trillions of bacteria, we really only see thousand or so out of possibly millions. We can only really characterize a very small subset of these microbes. So, you know, as science moves along, we're going to learn a lot more about the different functions that uh, these microbes are doing for us and the, you know, essentially the characteristics of these microbes. But these these microbes generate bioactive molecules that have far-reaching effects in the body. A, a recent paper 
dove into this and found that there is a little over 800 bacterial metabolites in our blood that are generated from our microbiome and uh, closer to 770 that are within our feces. So we're talking about thousands of bioactive molecules that can affect our microbiome, it can affect our gut, and it can affect our physiology throughout the body, not simply just within the gut. So how does our gut microbiome work? As I mentioned, microbes cover everything exposed to the external world, everything. Even in your house, there are microbes everywhere, covering everything, and that includes you. Environmental conditions within the area that these microbes are contained dictate which microbes are going to kind of live there. Things such as the amount of oxygen, whether it's an aerobic or an anaerobic environment, the pH, uh, the nutrient sources available, antimicrobial peptides, which are secreted into the gut, things of that nature. These, these are all going to affect what grows in a given environment. And individual microbes will breed communities. So you'll have one microbe that will use a nutrient source and they'll spit out a bunch of metabolites. And these metabolites will feed other microbes who will create other metabolites that bring other microbes. And over time, you develop a community. And these communities interact with the host meaning you uh, and your entire environment. So this is what we're talking about when we're talking about a microbiome. We're not, a lot of people focus, well, you know, do you have lactobacillus or do you have bifidobacteria? But our microbiome is a giant community. It is effectively an ecosystem that regulates our health. And while it's important to know the individual members uh, that are, you know, contributing to that, it's that it really is that community as a whole that is important for our overall health. So to just kind of give you a little more uh, simplistic view of what's going on with our microbiome, we can kind of talk about what happens with a plant microbiome. Yes, plants are exposed to the external world, so there will be microbes covering them and their root structures. Now, what's really interesting with uh, kind of the plant microbiome is we have, uh, let's just start, there's not really a start to this. The whole development of the plant depends on the microbiome and vice versa, but we're going to kind of just start from the plant's perspective. You know, we have this plant, let's say a tomato plant, as you see in this uh, image, and this plant secretes exudates from its roots into the soil. Now, what are exudates? They're basically molecules that the plant is using uh, just to send out into the soil. And these uh, kind of attract specific microbes from the soil uh, microbiome. And these, um, these microbes kind of fasten up and uh, sidle on up to the roots and begin kind of um, utilizing these exudates for nutrients. And then they're secreting other, uh, they're secreting metabolites that regulate plant growth. And you're attracting this microbiome. So what you're getting in this soil is just this giant community of microbes that are doing various beneficial things for the plant. Um, they're pulling nitrogen out of the air and into the soil because a plant cannot use nitrogen from air. It has to come up through the root structure. Uh, it is making phosphate soluble. Uh, a lot. Of, basically, it's making nutrients available. Um, it's helping, uh, it's creating antimicrobial compounds that prevent pathogens from damaging the plant. It also stimulates the plant to create antioxidants to help make it stronger. Uh, it's decomposing organic matter, again, liberating nutrients from dead animals and uh, other rotting plants and things of that nature. And it's really this mutualism that's going on between them. The, the plant is secreting these exudates, which can be uh, flavonoids, coumarins, uh, various kind of molecules that the plant secretes. It brings these bacteria. These bacteria um, are making the plant, uh, the nutrients available in the soil. They're boosting the plant's defenses and they're stimulating growth. Uh, so overall, they're making a much healthier plant. The plant grows stronger, more resilient to pathogens and environmental stress, and it clearly gets a uh, reproductive advantage because it's stronger and it's less likely uh, to die and being bigger in general uh, with plants catching pollen and th things of that nature, um, you know, size does matter. So uh, we, we're just seeing, we, we, even within the plant kingdom, it's this microbiome host relationship that really builds a healthy host, or in this case, specifically a tomato plant. So let's just put a pin in this whole discussion on soil microbes. I promise we're going to come back to it, which is really interesting, kind of um, uh, how this uh, impacts us too. 
Let's shift back towards our gastrointestinal tract and just kind of discuss the changing conditions in the gut and how this leads to a very different uh, microbiome in different areas of the gastrointestinal tract. So as you can see here, if you if you look at the image on the left, there is a quite a large variance between the stomach, the small intestine, and the colon. Just to kind of give you a brief um, a brief description of the differences. The stomach is effectively an acidic machine. It's used to break down our food. Very little absorption occurs there um, as a result of the high levels of hydrochloric acid. Very little bacteria grows there. It has a thick, dense mucus layer. That's to protect um, the gastric, gastric epithelium from getting damaged by the, um, by the acid that is uh, secreted within there. So we have a single mucus layer. We have pits and you know, generally speaking, we have a uh, low pH. So the stomach uh, is different than the small intestine and the colon, basically because the stomach is not for digestion or absorption um, or housing bacteria. The stomach is for killing bacteria and breaking down proteins. Next, we have the small intestine, which is again different uh, in terms of the mucus layer. It has a very thin, loose mucus layer. Uh, it's not impenetrable like the, the one in the stomach. Uh, we also have finger like projections called villi, uh, which increase the surface area so we can absorb more of our food. And we also have a high amount of um, panath cells. Now these panath cells, uh, they secrete antimicrobial peptides because we can't have a dense inner mucus layer in the small intestine. If we did, we wouldn't be able to absorb our nutrients. So rather than focusing on a, a mechanical barrier, we have to focus more on the chemical barrier from uh, these panath cells. These are gonna regulate the, the types of bacteria uh, that are going to uh, live within the small intestine. You also have uh, enzymes and bile. Uh, so we have this loose mucus layer, enzymes and bile, and high levels of antimicrobial peptides selecting for the types of bacteria we're going to have in the small intestine, which are going to completely differ uh, from that found in the stomach. And finally, the colon. The colon is effectively made to house bacteria, oddly enough. Uh, you have a very similar structure. You have similar pits um, that you find in the stomach. You do not have uh, like villi so much because you don't you're not really absorbing in the colon uh, other than um, water secretion absorption and uh, electrolytes and a small number of vitamins. Not a whole lot of absorption occurs in the colon. So you have this very, very dense inner mucus layer and then you have this loose outer mucus layer. Um, and that outer mucus layer is where the vast majority of your microbiome lives. That whole inner mucus layer is, is there to prevent uh, bacteria from interacting with the epithelial cells that make up your intense intestine. You also don't have panic cells in there because you want to have some bacteria. You really don't want to uh, kill them all off. And uh, we, while we're referring to the colon as one area, the colon is actually different segments. You have the cecum, uh, which is a kind of a little pouch that the appendix hangs off of. You have uh, the ascending colon, the transverse colon, descending colon, some sigmoid colon, and the rectum. These are all different areas, and they have different um, different environmental conditions, different pH, uh, different oxygen level, uh, levels, and things of that nature, different nutrient availability. So uh, even though the colon is kind of one segment of the gastrointestinal tract, uh, it creates various niches for our microbiome that is going to change the microbiome within each distinct area. So it's probably important to point out uh, kind of a little in a little more detail the environmental factors that regulate the microbiome. And we're going to begin with uh, the stomach. As mentioned, the stomach is a microbe killing monster. And that is because it is very, very low pH, a pH of one to three. And that leaves us with around 10 to 1,000 colony forming units uh, of bacteria per milliliter. Uh, it's also higher in oxygen than the other areas, and we generally are going to see lactobacillus, streptococcus, staphylococcus, and entero enterobacteracea. Um, some of these are found in the mouth, so they make their way into the stomach, and since some of them can live within the stomach, then um, they are able to do so. Next, we have the small intestine, which we break up uh, between the duodenum, which is the first part, and then the jejunum and ileum, which are the second and third parts. Again, the duodenum, since it's receiving that acid load from the stomach, is um, it starts uh, to have very little bacteria, although the pH does increase uh, due to um, bicarbonate being dumped in there. 
still see a low amount around 10 to 1,000 colony forming units per milliliter. Uh, the oxygen levels drop substantially, more than in half, and we see basically the same uh, bacteria that we see in the stomach. Uh, moving on to the je jejunum and ileum, uh, we have a much higher, um, much higher amount of uh, bacteria there. You know, you're starting in the orders of 10,000 to you know a million to 10 million. Again, low low oxygen levels. You're going to see some of the bacteria that you're going to see later on in the colon, such as Bifidobacterium, Bacteroides, and again some of the ones that you also see um, in the duodenum. Interestingly, in the ileum, uh, we reabsorb bile acids, and when this happens, it causes a massive secretion of antimicrobial peptides, and that's because they're right next to the colon, where there are you know trillions of bacteria um, that are just sitting there waiting to um, uh, sitting there waiting to kind of sneak into the small intestine, so you really need defense mechanisms there. Then moving along to the colon, as mentioned, different segments um, are going to yield different environmental conditions and different microbes. We're not going to go into that level of depth, uh, but the pH is a little higher. It's seven, um, whereas in, you know the small intestine was six to seven. We're seeing you know billions to trillions of colony forming units per milliliter, and you have a lower amount of oxygen, uh, again, depending on the area of the colon, and uh, you're gonna see basically all of your commensals hanging out in the colon here. So when we look at this, um, they're kind of hanging out in the uh, that outer mucus layer, uh, and some of them are even using that outer mucus layer as a nutrient source, which we'll discuss in a moment, but there are so many different factors that play a role in uh, what's going on in your microbiome, where you live, your genetics, um, whether you exercise or not, the amount of exercise, the intensity of the exercise, the type of environment you do your exercise in, stress exposures, antibiotics, age, uh, the motility of your stomach, which can be uh, can be altered by both genetics and by environmental conditions and diseases such as type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes, which can lead to gastroparesis or delayed gastric uh, emptium due to poor motility. Uh, antimicrobial peptides and immunoglobulin A, again, there are going to be environmental and genetic factors that regulate that. Gastric acid secretion, that varies according to age, um, again, genes, environment, type of diet. Clearly important, especially you know whether you're eating a kind of a garbage fast food diet or you're eating a diet of whole and unprocessed foods. And finally, which is actually initially, the mode of delivery you experienced when you were a child. As I mentioned, uh, there is a vaginal microbiome, and if you uh, go through a vaginal de delivery, you are exposed to that vaginal microbiome. Whereas if you uh, go through a C-section, you will not be exposed to those same levels of microbes. And this can have an impact, even though it's a um, you know a, it's at the very very beginning of your life. This can have far-reaching uh, uh, ramifications on what your microbiome does from there on out. So the gist of the whole thing, um, basically, when we're focusing on the colon microbiome, where 95% of them reside, undigested and unabsorbed nutrients enter the colon. Um, for example, fiber or polyphenols, we don't really digest them very well. Um, and polyphenols, we don't really absorb very well. So they enter the colon. Microbes feed on those nutrients, creating metabolites. Now, as mentioned earlier, uh, a recent paper found that there are around 812 metabolites from the microbiome found in our blood and 770 metabolites from our microbiome that are found in our stool. Some of these metabolites will feed other bacteria, and this brings along the idea of what is known as a keystone species. It's uh, kind of a, if you build it, they will come. When you get these keystone species and you continue to feed them, they make these metabolites that bring other species and they just keep bringing friends. And so you have these single um, keystone species that lead to the to development of a microbiome, a community with a lot of their friends, which can be beneficial. This creates a stable community and the interesting thing about this as well, which is kind of what we're seeing in uh, the image here to the left, is you have these microbes and they have genes and proteins and they share genes and proteins. And interestingly enough, a microbe within your colon can give one of its genes to a different microbe. So like these, these really are communities, stable communities that share genes and they share proteins and enzymes. And so these stable communities can create a stable 
situation within the gut where you have health, unless you get into a situation where let's say you get an infection or you consume something like alcohol uh, that can disrupt the uh, gut microbiome, you end up destabilizing these communities and you can have problems that come up uh, where you get increased inflammation, you'll get immune cells that may react to typically beneficial microbes, um, or you can even experience situations with nutrient deficiencies. Um, there's just a whole lot that can go on when you destabilize this microbial community living within your colon. It really is trying to, it's basically a community that is trying to build a healthier community. So it gives you gut health, and when your gut is operating properly and it is healthy, it actually creates, helps stimulate this environment to be be more conducive to the growth of this community so that it's really is it's like kind of having a neighborhood watch all looking out for one another and then the environment itself looking out for the neighborhood watch to prevent creeps from coming into the neighborhood aka pathogenic bacteria that can really mess up what's going on a great case study for how this works uh, can is involves short chain fatty acids Short chain fatty acids are the byproduct of the fermentation of fiber by the microbes within our gut. Not all the microbes, there are certain microbes that can ferment uh, fiber and it creates these short chain fatty acids. Uh, this only happens because we can't digest the fiber. If we digested and absorbed the fiber before it got to the colon, they would never get a crack at this. Fortunately, we can't make um, enzymes that break down fiber. So the fiber makes it all the way through our digestive tract, gets into the colon and is fermented by the bacteria. They create these short chain fatty acids. These short chain fatty acids, uh, which go are typically, there's a whole bunch of them. Primary ones in humans are acetate, propionate and butyrate. Uh, but there are a bunch of other ones as well. Uh, these short chain fatty acids alter the functions of the cells in the gut. It can increase uh, mucus, mucus production, so you get a thicker mucus layer, uh, and it can alter enteroendocrine cell hormone signaling. Uh, enteroendocrine cells are cells within the gut that sense nutrients and send out hormones uh, that regulate gut function, but also travel to the brain and fat tissue and things of that nature uh, to kind of signal uh, what's going on. So we have these communities of bacteria fermenting, making these short chain fatty acids. Some of them go to the local area. They go to the epithelial cells within the gut and they promote health within the gut. Some of these short chain fatty acids enter the blood. They can go to the liver. Propionate, for example, uh, is a, a substrate for gluconeogenesis. We would use it to make sugar. Uh, so when you're deeply fasted, um, which we'll discuss in a minute, um, some microbes ferment your mucus layer and they create propionate. Propionate then goes directly to the liver and it can function as a substrate to make glucose. You're fasted, you're not getting glucose, so you need to use gluconeogenesis, uh, creating glucose out of other materials so that uh, you can maintain stable blood sugar. Alternatively, these um, uh, short-chain fatty acids can cause the stimulation of hormones that travel into the blood to the brain, and they can regulate our behavior, um, appetite, suppression, regulate what we want to eat, regulate our energy expenditure, expenditure alter motility. They can promote... Um, uh, they can promote motivation and things of that nature. Um, but we also have these short chain fatty acids. Uh, they're going everywhere as well. And they're having effects everywhere. They're not, this isn't a comprehensive view. This is just some of the things uh, that these metabolites can do. Uh, and this is simply just, you know, we're talking about five or six out of, you know, 1500 different metabolites that are being made in your gut that we are aware of at this time. Up to this point, we've talked a lot about food, different types of food that you can eat, nutrient sources, how they lead to metabolites um, that interact with our gut microbiome. Our microbes make other metabolites that attract other bacteria, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but we really haven't talked about time yet. And, and time is really important. Um, uh, we have our own circadian rhythm, which is how our body kind of tells time, but our organs throughout our body have each have their kind of own circadian rhythm as well. These are called peripheral clocks and our intestinal microbiome also has a circadian rhythm. Uh, the, it follows the circadian rhythm. You see changes in bacterial proportions uh, where you know you have the same microbes but you see a lot more at certain times than others. Um, they change locations. As mentioned, uh, if you thin out the mucus layer, if, if they're hacking away at the mucus layer, these bacteria can get closer and further away um, from the intestinal barrier and they change their function as well. Um, 
for the most part, our intestinal microbiome is regulated by the, the times that we eat, um, the diet that we're eating, as well as our own personal circadian rhythm. We can disrupt these by having you know, irregular eating patterns, meaning we eat at different times of the day, every day, in a high fat diet. Keeping in mind the high fat diet is not like a keto diet, a high fat diet for, for this discussion is basically a garbage junk food diet, like say eating at McDonald's and uh, Burger King all the time. So this timing of our meal exposures, as well as our just general circadian rhythms, create a rhythm of microbial metabolites that interact with our other circadian clocks, the one in the gut, uh, ones with our muscles, everywhere, the liver, everywhere throughout the body. Uh, interestingly, um, it seems as though polyphenols, which are the um, kind of the antioxidant substances found in plants that give them their color, um, and tryptophan metabolites, tryptophan is, uh, is an amino acid, these can regulate our circadian clocks within our gut um, via something called the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. It basically notices when xenobiotics or things that are not of our body enter, um, and it interacts with those things. So this creates um, a situation where we have our microbes uh, altering polyphenols in a way that now our intestinal cells can absorb. Our cells absorb them in the colon, and this kind of alters our circadian rhythm. So we have here we have uh, our microbes communicating with our gut, which has its own circadian rhythm, to kind of help tell the time. They're trying to synchronize with one another to help promote balance and health within the microbiome. Let's synthesize what we've discussed up to this point on, um, on the front of how diet, what we're eating, as well as timing when we're eating can play a role in what's going on with our microbiome. So first, let's begin in the presence of fiber, microbes ferment it, creating butyrate. Now, they're creating all three types. It's not just, you know, fiber's not just making uh, butyrate, but when you get fiber in there, that increases the proportion of bacteria that make butyrate. Uh, and then this butyrate promotes synthesis of mucus uh, within the uh, intestinal, um, or in the colon specifically. And so this is gonna make that mucus layer much, much thicker. Then you're not providing yourself with food. Food is no longer there. There is no fiber there. This is during your fast, deep in your fasting period. Uh, uh, different microbes will ferment the mucus layer. And when they ferment the mucus layer, uh, that creates varying proportions of these metabolites. You'll see an increase in acetate and propionate. Again, propionate can go to the liver and um, promote uh, the production or act as a substrate for the production of glucose when you don't have access to it. But acetate and propionate can feed other microbes from within the microbiome. And so uh, in this image, we have Acromansia mucinophila, mucinophila meaning mucin loving. Uh, this is a bacteria when we're fasting, ferments our mucus mucus layer. It creates acetate, propionate, and 1,2-propendiol, which is a, um, is a metabolite of propionate. It goes in. It feeds these other bacteria. Uh, a note that I want to kind of focus on here is Fecal bacterium prausnitzi. This is one of those keystone species that I uh, was discussing earlier. When you bring these guys, they bring their friends, and then you just get this kind of compounding effect where you get a much, um, much more diverse population of healthy bacteria by simply having this uh, keystone species, Fecal bacterium prausnitzi specifically. And then these cross feeders create acetate, propionate, and butyrate, and these can regulate um, functions going on uh, within the intestinal layer. And so we have this giant community of bacteria kind of uh, ebbing and flowing throughout the day. You're going to see uh, as Acromantia ferments a mucus layer, they're going to start to see a greater production of these cross feeders. And then when you feed them, uh, when you feed them fiber, they're going to have more food and it's going to create more and more and more. And you're just getting this steamrolling effect um, where you're getting this beneficial effect um, by providing the right foods during the right times of day to help promote a, a, a more diverse and stable, healthy microbial community in your colon. So now that we know how this whole system kind of works, the basics of it anyway, let's talk about building a healthy microbiome. How do we build a healthy microbiome? What do we need to do on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis in order to build a healthy microbial community that can promote health in the colon and throughout our body? 
first and foremost, observe good circadian habits. These microbes have evolved with us. Our microbiome has evolved alongside of us for most of, well, all of human evolution. So we want to observe good circadian habits because those have been present through most of our evolution. That's getting proper and consistent lighting. We're talking about the when right now, getting proper and consistent light exposure. During the day, you want a high amount of light exposure. Go outside. Being inside is not the same as getting light exposure outside. Go outside and expose your eyes uh, to the daylight as much as you can throughout the day. And then at night, we want low light exposure, uh, signaling to the body it's time to wind down, um, that it's dark. Uh, this is going to help create that healthy circadian rhythm within the microbiome. Uh, I recommend lowering light exposure, uh, lowering the sources of light, altering the sources of light, making sure uh, they're not heavy in blue light. You can wear blue blockers, but they are very optional. You really don't need them at all. Um, and they're probably, uh, they're a useful hack if you have no interest in doing the most important things, which would be to keeping your house effectively dark at night. Um, you can have a couple of lights on. Um, you want them, uh, you don't want them high up overhead. Uh, but blue blockers are really not as, uh, as big of a factor as many people think they are. Be active during the day. Uh, temperature is another important signal that our body uses for our circadian rhythm. So when you're up and around and creating heat with your muscles, that's gonna heat up your body. That's gonna help synchronize all of the cells within your body with one another, with, within each organ structure and so on and so forth. Create a feeding window that's centered around the daytime. And um, I say centered around the daytime. Timings vary for all of this. Um, it's It really isn't a, for the most part, you can't really just say everybody should wake up at 7 a.m. and go to bed um, at uh, you know 10 or 11 p.m. It's different for everybody. Uh, it does vary uh, based on genetics, not so much genetics as age, but it does vary based on that. But you can live a perfectly healthful and fruitful life and get a healthy microbiome uh, with different timings for different individuals. So while, while one person may do well with you know finishing starting their uh, eat, feeding at like say 7 a.m. and shutting it down at at like four other people are perfectly fine eating with a you know a 7 a.m to a 7 p.m feeding window what's most important is that you are observing a feeding and fasting window and you're not just feeding all day every day while you're awake consume mostly whole unprocessed foods most people should consume a colorful high fiber omnivorous diet some people won't do well on a type of diet like this and yes I do suspect that some people can live a, a perfectly healthy lifestyle and have a perfectly healthy gut with very minimal plant consumption. I don't think that that's ideal. Um, I do think that the, uh, uh, the biggest benefit to the microbiome is going to be centered around plant foods. It is potentially within the realm of possibility that a mostly meat diet will um, will yield good gut health benefits. We just don't know that it happens. The, the evidence we have now indicates that most people should consume a colorful, health, high fiber, omnivorous, healthy diet um, that is whole and unprocessed foods. We know that this yields uh, health in people. Uh, we do not know if it is possible to yield the same level of long-term health eating a diet that is relatively you know, light in plant material, low in fiber, um, and not omnivorous. But I don't want to, I want to leave the window open for that to be a possibility. I'm all open for studies to show that it is. I don't care uh, what a healthy diet is. And I'd make the argument that if somebody's eating a mostly um, animal based diet and it's leading to a healthy weight that they can attain with an omnivorous diet, that the uh, carnivorous diet is probably better for them. Which is a perfect segue to maintain a healthy weight. Really important to maintain a healthy weight. Uh, I know a lot. Of, Part of the problem with the microbiome research is it got people under the erroneous initial idea that pretty soon we'd just be able to give people probiotics and by giving them the right probiotics, they'd just lose weight from the probiotics, but it doesn't seem to be that way and it don't, doesn't seem like it'll ever be that way. Um, the uh, bad microbiome that tends to come coupled with obesity, type 2 diabetes, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and things of that nature do, does seem to be a bad microbiome brought on by bad environmental factors, bad diet, alcohol consumption, uh, poor lifestyle choices, and all that matter. So you have to correct the lifestyle choices to get the healthy microbiome. It's not going to go the other way around. Um, we do know that chronic hyperglycemia damages enteric nerves, and our enteric nerves are going to regulate that environment. Uh, our enteric nervous system is an autonomous uh, 
nervous system that exists in our gut, it can function on its own and damaging those nerves is going to change environmental conditions within the gut enough to kind of promote an unhealthy microbiome. Furthermore, liver pathology neg negatively affects the microbiome and vice versa. Uh, bile, uh, which is really important for the emulsification and absorption of fats, is made in the liver. Uh, we do see people with fatty liver have a, a different kind of bile pool than uh, people who are otherwise healthy. And uh, we also have um, other factors such as inflammation, um, something called lipopolysaccharide moving from the gut to the liver within the portal vein, uh, all causing problems. So maintaining a healthy weight protects against all of these problems. Now, we talked earlier, told you to put a pin on the soil microbiome uh, thing. We're coming back to that. Plant-based foods are microbial monsters. Um, now, why is that? So you're going to find this particularly in roots, um, like rooty tubers and things of that nature. But remember, um, these uh, plants are secreting exudates from their roots, which are, are attracting bacteria. So if you're consuming the root of the plant, there are going to be a lot of soil microorganisms that are within that, that kind of promoted plant health. And to, to some extent are probably going to play an important role in helping you break down the plant. Um, interestingly enough, um, a lot of the kind of plant-based probiotic foods are real microbial monsters. You're basically getting packaged um, a vegetable, which, you know, depending on what your, uh, what type of uh, food you're eating, whether it's sauerkraut or kimchi or whatever, you're having a vegetable um, that is being basically broken down by a soil um, based bacteria or whatever is introduced into it that when once that gets into our system is going to create metabolites. Uh, and again, a recent paper showed that um, eating probiotic foods uh, did seem to introduce some of these keystone species. Uh, so when you're eating the when the people ate these probiotic foods, they didn't just see an increase in the prevalence of bacteria from the probiotic foods. They saw other the introduction of other uh, probiotic microorganisms that were not related to the food whatsoever. So this is probably coming uh, from this cross feeding that we mentioned. Avoid polypharmacy. Polypharmacy is uh, basically the unfortunate consequence of our healthcare system. And that is you have people taking what is effectively uh, a medic one medication for every decade the old they are. So someone in their 40s would be taking four medications, someone uh, in their 50s would be taking five and so on and so forth. Uh, there is substantial evidence now that this is terrible for your microbiome. It alters your microbiome and the number of medications you are taking is inversely proportional to uh, the diversity of your microbiome. So the more um, uh, medicines you're taking, the lower diversity of your microbiome. Of course, it's important to point out that some of this may be regulated by the poor lifestyle choices that led to relying on um, polypharmacy to maintain your health. Um, so when possible, use your lifestyle um, to kind of fight against chronic disease, cardiovascular disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes, um, the cancers that are related to lifestyle and uh, things of that nature. Um, you know, type 2 diabetes is very common um, and using medicines to regulate that can actually provide a beneficial effect uh, to the microbiome. Metformin has been shown to lead to beneficial changes in the microbiome. The problem is uh, prolonged, uh, prolonged unmanaged type 2 diabetes, even when you're using medicines, can lead to other pathologies, which is going to lead to other medicines. And again, you're getting to this, um, this point where um, you're on you know, 10 or 11 pharmaceutical drugs, um, which, you know, talk to your doctor, uh, if you're not going to use lifestyle, you absolutely should be taking these drugs to help manage them. Um, but talk to a doctor, talk to a dietitian to see um, what things you could be doing that can uh, lower your reliance on polypharmacy as you get old. Finally, limit alcohol intake. Alcohol uh, directly damages, it basically thins out all the mucus layers. It damages the stomach, it damages the small intestine, it can damage the colon if you drink enough of it. Uh, and it kills bacteria. Think about alcohol. Um, alcohol is uh, effectively an antiseptic you put it you know you would put it on wounds to prevent um, a um, an infection but alcohol isn't only acting on bad bacteria it's acting on good bacteria too so if you drink too much alcohol um, that can be problematic you'll also want to limit your intake of preservatives from food because again what are preservatives meant to do they're uh, meant to reduce spoilage which means they're meant to prevent bacteria from breaking down the food and um, making it spoil so you'll want to limit your preservative intake as well. We're going to finish up discussing uh, something that is 
becoming more and more common. There's companies kind of coming out uh, with these things. I believe Thrive uh, does this. Uh, and, the, and there's a question to whether or not a lot of people say, you know, can, can, can a microbiome test tell us what foods are best for us? The short answer is not now. Uh, the long answer is hopefully it will be able to in uh, in the future. But currently the data we have now, this is all hypothesis. Um, there's no good data to say that we can look at your microbiome and dictate which foods are better for you um, and that this leads to better health outcomes. We have ideas, again, uh, you know, I mentioned some of the general principles, you know, increase polyphenol intake, increase fiber intake, yada, yada, yada. Those things are just general uh, principles. But at the point we're at now, we do not have any evidence that taking a microbiome test and uh, getting a food list of foods that are, you know, quote unquote, good for you is something that we can do and is going Going to lead to any appreciable changes in your health. I do think this is a hot area of research. I do think there's going to be some interesting stuff that comes out about this. Um, one company, Zoe or Zoe, I don't know how they pronounce it. Um, they uh, they are publishing studies on this. Uh, they're the predict trials, uh, which are again their goal is to see if we can predict how uh, people's individual responses to food changes based on things like the microbiome. They have some really interesting things. It is absolutely clear that you can dictate, uh, you can determine rather, um, what a person's metabolic response to food is going to be based on their microbiome. So you can tell if, you know, certain foods are probably going to cause hyperglycemia or potentially even hypoglycemia or change the way blood lipids happen. There's a hundred percent agreement that that is likely something that we will be able to do in the future and then our microbiome plays a, a pretty robust effect on how we respond to our foods but we just don't have the data now to say that if you have this set of microbes then you should eat this type of food to be healthiest um, i really hope it does happen soon i think it is an interesting topic and i do think there is loads of applicability that can come down the road it's simply just not there yet it's not ready for prime time that about wraps it up. Thank you all for listening in. If you like this video, please like and share it on social media. If you have any questions, comments, or constructive criticism, drop it down in the comments section below. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, this is going to function as kind of the lead in video to the uh, How to Build a Healthy Microbiome series. We've already got a couple of videos on that. So check those out. Uh, those are on the channel. You can just type in how to, um, how to Build a Healthy Microbiome and they should pop right up. Thank you very much for listening in and take care.